uh, is not covered in the lecture outline. So this is totally new material. I apologize for this. Um, and uh, the question says, draw a picture of the following orbitals, uh, A, 1s, 2s, and 3s on the same set of axes. Uh, let's tackle that one first. And uh, although we've talked somewhat about this and we've done some calculations with this, so 1s, 2s, and 3s, so uh, let's do A here. If we draw them on the same set of axes, uh, yeah, and uh, the S uh, sublevels uh, in which there is only one orbital are all spheres. And so when we draw them, we draw circles. And where previously we would call this N equals 1, we are now calling this 1s. And 2s is bigger than that. And I don't know if I'm going to actually draw them to scale because uh, the sizes are uh, not, there's not a linear difference between them and the sizes. But we do know that 2s is larger than 1s. And 3s is larger than 2s. Okay. Um, and uh, 4s and 5s and 6s just get increasingly larger. Uh, and these are really spheres, but we're drawing them as circles. Okay. And that's actually the answer for letter A. For letter B, we will now draw the 2s and 2px on the same set of axes. The 2s, I'm going to try and draw exactly the same. So I'm going to try and draw it just like I did over here. It's going to be a sphere. It's going to be about this big. And again, I'm drawing this sphere as a circle. And that's 2s. Now, uh, again, this is something I don't think I covered. I don't think I covered the uh, 2p shapes of the orbitals. But a 2p orbital looks like this. And I'm going to draw it in red. And a 2p orbital has two lobes. Two lobes or two parts. Oh, I'm going to zoom in here and see if we can get a slightly better uh, focus on this. Two lobes or two parts. And this is one orbital. And I'm going to call this the x-axis here. And because of that, this is going to be 2px. And the reason I wanted you to draw this, even though I didn't cover it in the lecture, this is an important point, the lecture outlines that is, um, is that uh, you can see that the 2s and the 2p orbitals both end at approximately the same distance from the nucleus. That's an important point, so I'm going to write it down. So the 2s and 2p orbitals both end at approximately the same distance from the nucleus. Both end at approximately, and there's my squiggly equal sign, the same distance from the nucleus. So, uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. And sort of the way I think about this is that when you have a 1s sublevel and a 1s orbital, there's only one way to put electrons in there. So there's only one orbital in all of the 1s and the n equals 1 sublevel. Um, and then for n equals 2, the sphere is bigger. So the first two electrons go into what's called the 2s orbital and the 2s sublevel. But there's still enough room that you can fit more electrons in there. And they start going into the 2p sublevel. And in fact, for 2p, there are three orbitals. 
and one of them is shown here. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? One question that could come up is, okay, if this is one orbital and it's true that I've drawn it, that it is not touching the nucleus, the nucleus is at the center portion right here, then how does an electron get from part of the orbital to the other part of the orbital? And um, I will say a couple things. One is remember all of these shapes that we are drawing for these orbitals are the volume of space in which there is a 90% probability of finding the electron. And half of that probability would be on this left side, half of that probability would be on the right side. And it is true that there is no probability of the electron or a very uh, nearly uh, infinitely small probability of it being in here. And it can jump from one portion to the other. And that jumping is called electron tunneling. And um, we and that it comes from the fact that electrons exist as probabilities, and there is a very small probability that it will be right here, and then it effectively jumps over from one place to another. Well, um, and we know that from last time, electrons are uh, interesting creatures. They exist as probabilities, and uh, again, all of these shapes, and, and let me just make sure I cover this. Uh, this should have been covered in the lecture outlines. The definition of an orbital. An orbital is the volume of space in which there is a 90% probability of finding the electron. a 90% probability of finding the electron. Okay, these are 90% probabilities and the probability out of each outside of each of these orbitals decreases exponentially as you get outside of these spaces. Anyway, I know it's a little frustrating for me because uh, I'm showing you the results of quantum mechanics without actually doing any of the math. The math does require integration in three dimensions, and to solve this kind of math, you need to be through third semester calculus, which uh, I once did but have long forgotten, uh, although it's fun to think about sometimes. But sort of that's the frustrating thing about this course. One of them is that we are dealing with the results um, without really getting into the math or being able to. Anyway, so uh, in summary, a P orbital has two lobes. It's often called a dumbbell, and it's often represented by two balloons because uh, there can be balloon shapes as well. Now for C, it says, draw the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz orbitals on the same set of axes. I'll do that down here. And um, just to remind you, the 2p sublevel has three orbitals, and each orbital holds two electrons, so for a total of six electrons, and when we do our uh, electron configurations, it will we'll actually write 2p6. That'll be the 2p sublevel with three orbitals, each orbital holding two electrons for a max of six electrons. Anyway, so now let me actually answer this question. So uh, 2px, 2py, and 2pz are going to be shapes just like this along each of their respective axes. So I'll draw them actually in, I think, three different colors. Do I have, no, I only have three colors. I thought I might even have four colors here, but uh, let's see. So the nucleus always at the origin 
I just drew for you two PX. So let me draw for you again. When you draw them, do not touch the nucleus. It gets very close, but it does not touch the nucleus. And then there's for sort of spherical. And they're supposed to be the same size. Uh, mine's a little smaller on this side, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. And again, that is 2px because I've defined this as the x-axis. The atom can't tell its x from its y from its z-axis, uh, but we will assign a configuration. Now uh, let's call this the y-axis. And for the y-axis, these two shapes will be along the y-axis. And they should be the same shapes. My attempts at drawing them may not be. So this is 2PY. And the hard one, of course, is the Z-axis. I'll try and draw that in red. The Z-axis is coming straight out of the page at you and going straight back into the page. And the way that I'm going to draw that is I'm going to draw it coming out to the side like this and getting wider. And this is just the axes, by the way. And then um, I will draw a balloon. In that balloon, the line gets thicker uh, out there. And I'll do an extreme zoom for you. So the line is here for the top of the uh, z-axis. And then the balloon gets a little thicker near the top. And that's what's called forced perspective. When things get closer to you, they look bigger. And then when things get farther from you, well, they're very tough to draw, um, but uh, when we draw them, we will draw them, and let me zoom out so I can draw this. We will draw them as dashed lines, as if they're harder to see or semi-visible. And so there will be a dashed balloon down there as well. And I apologize, I know this is tough to see. Uh, the third dimension, when you've got other overlapping dimensions, is always uh, tough, tough to draw. But it is something that in chemistry we will need to get used to because uh, the most important aspects of many chemical properties are related to shape. And that's where we're going is how to do shapes of molecules. And we will use this forced sense of perspective with things that get closer to you being larger throughout the rest of the course. Anyway, that's a little bit of how you do it. And uh, I guess I should label this red one as 2PZ. So I label all my axes. But now we know the shapes of S's and P's, P orbitals. And we know how to configure them around the nucleus. If this question were about 3S and 3P's, 3P orbitals have the same designations. They're just larger. And let me zoom back out. So 3p orbitals or 3px would be balloons or half dumbbells that go all the way out to the edge of 3s. Because the idea is that uh, when you have a 3s um, sublevel, that 3p fits inside it. And in fact, 3D fits inside 3S as well. Like 3S defines the largest shape for the N equals three principal energy level. Anyway, so I think uh, this actually is the one question that is exactly like I, it is in the homework. And again, um, so these are the answers to this one question. And I will ask you, uh, do you have any questions about it?